In this video, we're going to look at the pharmacology of hydrocortisone, specifically how it can be used uh, in terms of an anti-inflammatory agent or as a replacement therapy for someone who is suffering from adrenal insufficiency. So hydrocortisone, uh, when it's taken, is going to first bind to a uh, transport protein. This is called transcortin. So hydrocortisone will bind to the, trans, uh, to the transport protein transcortin, which is going to allow it for, uh, to have passage around the body. Hydrocortisone is not lipid soluble, so it does require this uh, transport to assist it in performing its function. Once we look at the functions of hydrocortisone, it plays two important roles. Hydrocortisone first is going to act as a glucocorticoid. So our hydrocortisone will act as a glucocorticoid and replace something like cortisol. So it's going to have glucocorticoid functions. The other important piece of hydrocortisone is that we'll act as a mineral corticoid. So if we think about something like aldosterone, hydrocortisone will also play this role. So it plays the role of a mineral corticoid. So what we'll do is break down each of these individual effects in order to understand the benefit of taking something like hydrocortisone. Now one of the most common uses for hydrocortisone is based on its anti-inflammatory effects. So we know that uh, glucocorticoids um, or something like hydrocortisone is going to have an anti-inflammatory impact. So if we take a look at the cell or take a closer look at the cell, we can investigate why hydrocortisone has an anti-inflammatory effect. What will happen when hydrocortisone makes its way to the cell is it will bind to the glucocorticoid receptor. And binding to this glucocorticoid receptor is going to have a number of intracellular signaling activations which are going to reduce inflammation. So one of the first things that we see is that activation of this glucocorticoid receptor is going to inhibit the function of nuclear factor kappa B, NFKB, or nuclear factor kappa B. And nuclear factor kappa B typically uh, plays an important role in resulting in an increase in translation of COX-2. So nuclear, kappa, or nuclear factor uh, kappa B, or NKFB, when activated, will move to the nucleus and increase translation, specifically of COX-2. So we see an increase in translation of COX-2. Now, if we think about the role of COX-2 or we think about the importance of COX-2, we can break down what's happening in terms of inflammation. So typically with inflammation, we're seeing activation of phospholipids, which will activate arachidonic acid, which then using COX-2 will lead to the production of prostaglandins and leukotrienes. Those two things together are going to promote inflammation. So what we see happening when someone is taking a corticosteroid or something like hydrocortisone is we have an inhibitory effect. So the release uh, or the activation of uh, hydrocortisone or the activation of glucocorticoid receptor as a result of taking hydrocortisone causes inhibition of NKFB so that we cannot see these factors functioning. So NKF NKFB is not going to function, which is not going to promote the translation of COX-2, which ultimately is going to lead to a reduction in inflammation. So that's one of the functions of hydrocortisone is we see inhibition of NKFB. So we get inhibition. We actually also see an increase in translation. So activation of the glucocorticoid receptor is going to lead to the increase in translation of something called annexin-1. So one of the more positive effects that we see for the glucocorticoid receptor is we actually see activation of translation in the uh, nucleus, which is going to promote the formation of something called annexin-1. So activation of the glucocorticoid receptor is going to lead to activation of the nucleus to cause translation and cause translation of something called annexin-1. One. And annexin-1 one plays an important role in inhibiting the, trans, uh, the transformation of or the activation of arachidonic acid from phospholipids. So what we're going to see is the step where we move from phospholipid to arachidonic acid is inhibited or is not allowed to progress as a result of annexin-1. So annexin-1 is going to have an inhibitory effect on movement from prostaglandins to arachidonic acid, which will also decrease inflammation. So we see inhibition here as well. So two things to remember is when the glucocorticoid uh, binds or hydrocortisone binds to the glucocorticoid receptor, the first thing that we get is inhibition of NFKB or nuclear factor kappa B, which is going to prevent the translation 
of COX-2 or prevent the nucleus of the cell from performing translation and creating COX-2. Without COX-2, I'm not having the movement towards prostaglandins and inflammation. So binding of hydrocortisone inhibits the progression from uh, NK FKB to COX-2. The other piece is that we actually see activation of translation in the nucleus to form an XN1. An XN1 is going to inhibit the uh, basically the movement from phospholipids to arachidonic acid. So we see inhibition of arachidonic acid formation, which is going to lead to a decrease in the downstream effects of arachidonic acid, which would be release of leukotrienes and prostaglandins and ultimately inflammation. So two mechanisms in which inflammation is re reduced or impaired when someone's taking something like hydrocortisone. The other role of glucocorticoids or hydrocortisone acting as a glucocorticoid that we have to look at is that uh, related to blood glucose levels. So something like cortisol acts as a counter-regulatory hormone or a hormone that is going to respond to de decreasing blood glucose levels as a result uh, increasing those levels. So our hydrocortisone will function to increase our blood glucose levels through a uh, variety of different uh, mechanisms. So hydrocortisone is going to impact both the pancreas and met uh, liver metabolism of glucose as well as metabolism of glucose throughout the body. So if we look at the role of hydrocortisone at the level of the pancreas, hydrocortisone is going to function to inhibit our pancreatic beta cells. So uh, if we draw on a pancreatic beta cell here, we know that this cell is going to be responsible for insulin release. So pancreatic beta cells are releasing uh, insulin into the body, and that insulin is going to promote the storage of glucose. So we know that insulin will uh, one, act uh, to store glucose within the cells. We start to see storage of glucose. One of the other functions we know insulin is going to have is increase the production of glycogen uh, or increase our glycogen stores. What we start to see when someone is taking hydrocortisone is we're going to inhibit that effect. So hydrocortisone is going to inhibit the pancreatic beta cells from releasing insulin so we're going to see a reduction in the amount of insulin that's being released, which means that we are no longer going to be storing our blood glucose, which would lead to an increase in our blood glucose levels. And we're, if we're not storing that blood glucose, then we're going to be inhibiting uh, our glycogen stores. Specifically, we're going to see the inhibition of glycogen stores in places like um, our liver, our skeletal muscle, um, and our peripheral adipose tissue. Now this isn't the only mechanism through which hydrocortisone use is going to promote an increase in blood glucose levels. We also see hydrocortisone acting on the liver to promote gluconeogenesis or the formation of new glucose. So uh, the use of hydrocortisone is going to lead to an increase in gluconeogenesis. And we're going to see this occurring through a number of different mechanisms. Something, one of the pieces that are going to happen uh, is going to act on our fat cells. We draw on some adipose tissue here. The use of hydrocortisone is going to lead to an increase in lipolysis from our fat cells. So hydrocortisone is going to increase lipolysis, which is going to produce glycerol and fatty acids. So we get lipolysis, which is going to create the byproducts of fatty acids and glycerol, which are two constituents that are going to promote gluconeogenesis. So when we have an increase in fatty acids and glycerol, the liver can perform gluconeogenesis better or can actually perform gluconeogenesis. The other piece that we're going to see through the use of hydrocortisone is an increase in proteolysis. So our proteins are going to break down. So things like our skeletal muscle are under going to undergo proteolysis. And this is important because we're going to see the release of things like amino acids and pyruvate, which are going to uh, support the creation of new glucose. So this too is going to provide the constituents for gluconeogenesis. So what we're going to see uh, as we have the release of hydrocortisone is going to be, or we, as we take hydrocortisone, is lipolysis and proteolysis, which is going to promote the release of fatty acids and glycerol, promote the release of amino acids and pyruvate, which will stimulate or uh, support the liver in stimulating gluconeogenesis. The other piece that we should remember is if we have a reduction in insulin and we're not taking as, uh, and we're not having as much insulin being released, this patient is going to have a decrease in glycogen formation. So we're not going to be creating as many uh, glycogen stores, which is going to allow for an increase in blood glucose levels as well. So we're not storing a lot of that glucose as glycogen. So finally, we need to take a look at the mineral corticoid function of hydrocortisone. And in this case, hydrocortisone is replacing the function of aldosterone. 
And we know that aldosterone is going to play two important roles. One is that the mineral corticoid role of aldosterone is going to be the reabsorption of sodium and the excretion of potassium. So we're basically looking at the distal convoluted tubule, and that distal convoluted tubule is going to reabsorb sodium while excreting potassium in response to aldosterone uh, release or the use of hydrocortisone. So we take a look at what's happening in our renal tubules. So if we take a look at the function of hydrocortisone on the kidney, we're looking primarily at its function at the distal convoluted tubule. So hydrocortisone is going to act at the level of the distal convoluted tubule, or a DCT, and it's going to have a couple of different mechanisms, or it's going to perform a couple of different functions. So we'll draw our blood supply in. So one of the things that hydrocortisone is going to do is go, it's going to promote the reabsorption of sodium into the blood supply. So we're going to retain sodium into the blood supply. The other piece that it's going to do is promote the excretion of potassium. So what we start to see is when hydrocortisone or aldosterone performs its function at the distal convoluted tubule, we take potassium out of the cell of the distal convoluted tubule, so it flows through channels in the distal convoluted tubule, into the urine for excretion. So we start to push more potassium into the urine for excretion. Alternatively, what we start to see is an increase in reabsorption of sodium. So instead of having sodium move into the urine or remain in the urine, you start to see uh, sodium being reabsorbed from the urine into the cells of the distal convoluted tubules. We start to see an increase in sodium reabsorption into the cells of the distal convoluted tubule. The other thing that's going to happen is hydrocortisone or aldosterone is going to promote the sodium potassium pump, which is going to promote shifting of these ions either into the blood supply. So when we activate the sodium potassium pump, we actually see shifting of sodium uh, or reabsorption of sodium back into the blood supply while we're going to see an increase in potassium being pushed into the cells of the distal convoluted tubule. So this is how we actually end up with excretion is we activate the sodium potassium pump which is going to pull sodium into the blood supply while pushing potassium into the cells of the distal convoluted tubule. This is going to mean that the cells of the distal convoluted tubule are being depleted of sodium, which is going to promote reabsorption through channels, while the concentration of, co of or potassium in the distal convoluted tubule is increasing, which is going to promote further excretion of that potassium. So the mineral corticoid function of our uh, hydrocortisone, or it's mimicking the functional aldosterone, is going to be to reabsorb sodium into the blood supply while excreting potassium into the urine. We know that this is going to have an impact on water. So the more sodium, as far as we're building sodium up within the blood supply, we're going to have wall water follow this sodium. So it's actually going to help increase blood volume as well. So we're going to see the increased absorption of water through the kidneys, uh, and water is going to follow that sodium, which is going to lead to an increase in blood volume. So we get a couple of different uh, features as the result of hydrocortisone uh, release or hydrocortisone use uh, in the kidneys. It is going to function on the di or act on the distal convoluted tubule, promote reabsorption of water and sodium while promoting the excretion of potassium.